The French philosopher Albert Camus famously said that the welfare of humanity is always the alibi of tyrants. This is why the abortion industry advertises their baby butchery as healthcare and women's equality. It's for the good of women, families in the country. While the left and the right in America rent their garments and scream for justice over tyrants like Vladimir Putin, we in America enable, empower, and celebrate tyrants that make Putin look like a saint. A name previously unknown to the vast majority of Americans is gaining a little bit of notoriety. His name is Dr. Cesare Santangelo, a serial murderer whose crimes the modern left either deny or celebrate. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Welcome to the show today, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am sorry it's been a while since it's just been you and I. I've been traveling a lot and only had time to do some interviews, but we've had some phenomenal guests on. I hope you've enjoyed the episodes um, discussing everything that's happening in the country, specifically with these infants, these precious children who were murdered in Washington, D.C., at the Washington, D.C. Sergi Clinic by abortionist Dr. Cesare Santangelo. And we had my friend A.J. Hurley on, who was involved in actually unboxing these children uh, from these hazardous waste container buckets to photograph the children, to document what apparently was partial birth abortion, which, uh, if you don't know, is illegal um, in um, America, and we'll go into a little bit uh, of that later. But partial birth abortions involve delivering a baby partially uh, and then sticking scissors into the back of their head to suction their brains out. Of the 115 babies that were recovered by pro life activists in Washington, D.C., five of them seem to have been killed through partial birth abortions. And so we want to discuss who this serial murderer is because most abortionists operate in secrecy and they operate under the coverage or the covering rather of the activist media and the culture of death who refuse to report on the activities of these abortionists even when they're breaking federal law of course they're not going to report on their activities generally that they kill babies because the culture writ large and certainly the activist media are all for killing babies through point of birth but when they're specifically breaking federal law through partial birth abortions the activist media refuses to cover even that and so most people don't even know these names and it's very important for us to expose these individuals and here's why because most Americans are frankly horrified at the pictures and the children who were killed by this abortionist that were killed into the late second and probably well into the third trimester this exposes what happens every day in America now what will the left say they'll say something like um, well, you know, late-term abortion, Seth, uh, that never happens. It, it almost rarely happens. I just got this, actually, at uh, Kennesaw State University. Um, I was just there last week uh, for the Students for Life Club and my last uh, speaking tour for this spring. And a bunch of protesters came in with their signs. And during the Q&A, they said, you know, late-term abortions never happen. And if they do happen, it's only to save the life of the mother who's about to die if the pregnancy continues. Well, there's about 12,000 abortions each year in America that happen post-viability. What's post-viability? After the baby could survive outside the womb. Uh, in the hospital, in a neonatal unit, with the help of heroic doctors. They don't require their mother's body, okay? Um, and uh, according to the Guttmacher Institute, which is Planned Parenthood Statistical Research Branch, they reported a study several years ago that most women, quote, uh, who are seeking later terminations are not doing so for reasons of fetal anomaly or life endangerment, Oops, that's Planned Parenthood's research branch. So Planned Parenthood is reporting, their research branch, that most women who get those late-term abortions, which the left tells you never happens, and if they do happen, it only happens to save the life of the mother, they're saying that most women who get those late-term abortions are not doing so because their life is endangered. So those are also just elective abortions. Now, of course, 12,000 abortions 
is a small number when you compare it to one million babies who were killed in the womb every year in America. You're right. That is a small number. But but step outside of the one million babies lynched in the womb every year and tell me if 12,000 is, is a small number. What, what was the... Uh, how many people were killed on 9-11, guys? Was it, uh, I think it was 350. It was something like the number of days in a year. I always remembered that. It was, it was hundreds, right? Uh, okay, you had, or actually, I'm sorry. It might have been a little over 1,000. Okay, you, we're talking 12,000. 12,000 babies are killed a year after they could have survived outside the womb. So in which case, why abort the baby at all? Just deliver the baby and let someone adopt the baby. According to a article and study uh, reported by Business Insider just a few years ago, there are 36 families f- um, for every one infant up for adoption. So we have 36 times too many families for the number of infants available for adoption. Why not just deliver the baby at that point? Because the left needs abortion. Because if they acknowledge the humanity and right to life of the post-viability unborn child, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to explain why the baby right before viability is something different. Like they're not a human and they don't have a right to life. Why? Just because they require a little bit more assistance living? Oh, right. Just like infants do. Infants cannot survive without the help of their mothers. So that's sort of just the background about late-term abortions in America. But Dr. Shashari Santangelo has been murdering late-term um, unborn children for many, many years. I believe he's been an abortionist since 2007. And abortionists who have become pro-life um, will be brutally honest about their activities, it, just like the Saul to Paul conversion. Um, Paul was incredibly honest about what he did. He called himself the worst of sinners. Um, he, he acknowledged that he helped murder Christians. Um, when you truly turn from your wickedness and you embrace the grace of Christ, you will be brutally honest about what you've been saved from, about what you actually did. And one such abortionist is named Kathy Altman. You may have seen her on interviews with Live Action or in various pro-life talks. And I'm grateful for her because of her honesty and her conversion. But I want to read to you something she said to set the stage for this episode. So former abortionist turned pro-life advocate Kathy Altman once said, When I became a doctor, I couldn't understand how the German doctors could do what they did until I read that article. An article about uh, abortions, late-term abortions in particular. Um, she said, they could just do it like I could kill babies because we didn't consider them human. This was the first time that I saw myself as a mass murderer. I thought, oh my gosh, I've killed a lot more people than Ted Bundy, but it wasn't illegal. And that was when I became pro-life. It's a sobering thought to admit that you are a mass murderer, especially in a culture that celebrates those mass murders under the euphemisms of demons, compassion, equity, women's health care, reproductive rights, reproductive justice, or to quote the alleged president of the United States who coined a new euphemism at the State of the Union when referring to abortion, maternal health care. Maternal health care. New one I'd never heard before until Joe Biden just pulled that out of his butt or likely written by one of his speechwriters at the State of the Union. Abortion is now maternal health care, guys, as says the president of the United States. Oh, so they're admitting that they're mothers, maternal meaning mothers, health care, referring to abortion. So mothers should have the health care right to murder their own children. These are the euphemisms that are required to dehumanize the unborn. It's very difficult to be this brutally honest about the number of babies and innocent persons you have murdered when the culture celebrates you, props you up, and calls you a hero. The abortion industry often refers to abortionists, by the way, as heroes. They literally use that word because they see these abortionists as sort of standing in the gap on behalf of women and holding back the Republican tyrannical tide that wants to control women's bodies or whatever stupid language they use. Well, Dr. Cesari Santangelo is a mass murderer, but he won't acknowledge it. He won't admit it. He will double down because he's making a lot of money killing these children. But don't worry, he's convinced himself that they're not really persons and they don't have any rights. Just as Nazi doctors convince themselves that, eh, you know, the, these Jews aren't really persons. They're untermensch, they're subhuman. 
And the same thing, of course, happens with abortion today. This is the power of bigotry, by the way, because bigotry blinds you to what would otherwise be obvious truths about human nature, right? This was sort of the whole thesis of my university lecture tour, and hopefully we'll release the audio from one of those, that bigotry is never recognized as bigotry when it's being practiced. Racism is never recognized as racism when it's being practiced. Nazis didn't think they were bad guys. Slaveholders didn't think they were bad guys, did they? No, they thought that they were exercising their rights. They viewed their activity as if not righteous, certainly right, something they were entitled to. This is why slavery was defended as economic rights, <laughs> right? And now abortion is exercised and defended as bodily autonomy, reproductive health care. Not ironically, the same arguments are actually used, aren't they? <laughs> the, when, when the left says bodily autonomy, my body, my choice, they're just telling you that the baby is their property. Oh, wait, we, <laughs> wait, wait, oh, some humans are property. We, we went down that road before, didn't we? So make no mistake, when you hear the my body, my choice or bodily autonomy arguments that sometimes acknowledge that the baby has a right to life, but that the mother's rights, her bodily autonomy rights, trump the child's bodily autonomy rights, they're just telling you the baby is the mother's property. Okay, haven't we learned our lesson that no human being is property? Well, this is how these children are treated, and these are how Dr. Cesari Sant Santangelo treats these children um, by convincing their mothers that uh, they can't really succeed if they don't go through this healthcare procedure, uh, that they need this because, um, you know, the boyfriend's not in the picture, and they're poor, and they really need to do this. He is located in Washington, D.C. His surgery clinic is listed as a member of the National Abortion Federation, and um, according to the website, the abortion facility openly acknowledges that it commits abortions up to 27 weeks. However, however, this is very important, abortion is legal in Washington, D.C. through point of birth. Okay. Now, I want to expose you to Dr. Cesari Santangelo um, because this is actually not the first time that he has been exposed, though this has certainly been the most public because now you have um, multiple, multiple, multiple members of Congress, of course, in the GOP, um, who are calling for investigations and who are promising if they take back the House and or the Senate, they will be calling for investigations as well. And we're going to get into why, because the autopsies are not being done. So it, you can't determine if this was partial birth abortion or not, though, if you have eyes, you'll be able to see that, though he has been exposed before. Back in 2013, I believe, by live action. Now, again, Santangelo has been uh, an abortionist, I believe, since 2007. But thanks to our good friends at Live Action and Lila Rose's team, who has done wonderful investigative journalism before, they have exposed him for, for, for admitting, right, to an undercover journalist that if a baby was born alive during the abortion procedure, they would just let him, they would just let the baby die. They just wouldn't do anything. That also breaks federal law, okay? And my, my apologies, this was from 2012, though I believe it was released in 2013. So here are two clips back to back really quick from this undercover journalism. And uh, you can't really find pictures of Cesare Santangelo, this Italian mass murderer, on social media or online for obvious reasons. Most abortionists, it's very difficult to find anything out about them because they know how controversial that they are, and so they like to operate and remain in secrecy. Um, but you'll get to see his face here. So go ahead and, and meet Dr. Cesari Santangelo. Does it ever, like, move or anything when it comes out? Or? That's why I try and, and uh, sever the umbilical cord first, and we okay. wait for that to, to stop pulsing. And that's why the, the uh, fetus is expired, so, so it does. Okay, so has it ever has it ever survived? After well, when, after when no, it comes out? Not, not here, no. Okay. No, it, it could. I mean, you know, if if some people go into labor, you know, prior to us, you know, when you do this, what we do is we we try and, and help the uh, cervix dilate, and some people will go into labor. Before we, we do the procedure, okay. and that can happen. Okay. You know, it's unusual. And then what? What do you? Usually, at this point in your what pregnancy, you it's, it's too early to survive. Usually, okay. it will expire shortly after birth. But if it did, like what? What would happen? Like, would I have to take it home or like be responsible yeah, for? I mean, you know, technically, you know, legally, we would be uh, obligated to help it, you know, to survive. But, you know, it, it probably wouldn't. 
it's all in, in how vigorously you do things to help a, a fetus survive. You know, there's, there's things you do. Obviously, you're here for a certain procedure, and if, if your, your pregnancy were, let's say you went into labor, the membranes ruptured, and you delivered before we got to the termination part of the procedure here, you know, then we would do things, we, we, would, we would not help it. Okay. Let's say we wouldn't we wouldn't uh, intubate. Let's okay. Say. Okay. So you would make sure. Yeah, we wouldn't do any extra. You know, it's like uh, it. It, yeah, it, it would be you know uh, a person that would be a terminal person in the in the in the hospital. Let's say that had right. cancer. You know, you wouldn't do any extra procedures to help that person survive. Okay. They had like do not resuscitate orders. Okay. You know, we would do the same thing here. Okay. Whereas if you were in. In, in a hospital in, in, in Virginia, let's say, and you went into labor and you went to the hospital and then they, they saw you deliver, they would do everything possible to help that, that fetus survive. Okay, but you won't? We wouldn't. Yeah. Okay. You know, and that's happened before, to tell you the truth. Really? Yeah, where, you know, uh, we've had patients that, you know, on the second day of the laminaria, they, they, they got some contractions and uh, they panicked and they were in Virginia at the hospital and they went to the hospital because they had some pain instead of calling me, you yeah. know, and they just went to the hospital and the hospital helped them to deliver, which was the stupidest thing they could have done, oh my God. you know, which was, you know, yeah. and they did everything they shouldn't have done, which was help them to deliver. And I'd hate to say, you know, take your time, think about it, go home. There's not much time left. How know? much time do I have? Not much. You know, I mean, I could say we could do this in a week or two, but I, I'd rather we do it now and, and be done with it because it, there's not much time. Dr. Cesari Santangelo, you just met a mass serial murderer whose name everyone in the world would know if his victims were just a little bit older, right? If these were one-year-olds, if these were five-month-olds, this would be national headlines in most Western countries today. But because his victims are a little bit younger and because they're located in the uterus of their mothers and described as the property of their mothers, then his crimes are defended as equity, as just health care. So he's a hero. And the modern left will never cover such heinous admissions from an abortionist who, in this case, is saying he's willing to break federal law. Now, he's incredibly honest with how he kills babies, right? He says, well, hey, we'll, we'll just sever the umbilical cord first, right? So the baby would die because, gosh, we, we wouldn't want that baby to be born alive during the abortion procedure, my goodness. And he says that happens sometimes, you know, and, and if that happens, gosh, uh, well, we'd be required to take care of it, right? He calls it it. Uh, I, I think he did. I think he had a Freudian slip there actually at the beginning when he said baby. Oops, you're not supposed to say that. Um, so uh, we would make sure that the baby would be killed in the womb, not outside the womb. Because, you know, you know, the birth canal, it's magical. You know, it, it confers personhood as you slip out of the birth canal. So that's why we have laws on the books that would require us to care for the baby after the baby came out of the vaginal canal. But as long as it hasn't, uh, you know, made that six inch magical personhood conferring journey yet, then it's not a person. And so we would just kill it uh, in the womb. Um, but this investigative journalist, to her credit, says, well, but what would happen if, if the baby was born alive during the abortion procedure? And he said, well, it would just expire shortly after birth. I mean, legally, we'd be required to help it survive. But, you know, but we wouldn't. We would just not help it, he says. He literally says that. We would just not help it. And he says, you know, like those hospitals, they have to. You know, he says sometimes we have women come in uh, and, and then they go to the hospital later before the abortion's done, you know, like, let's say, like, they're dilating the cervix for a late-term abortion. Usually you leave and you come back to the abortion center later, just so you guys know how that works. Um, and they went to the hospital, he says. He said that, which was the stupidest thing to do. Did you hear him say that? Why was that the stupidest thing to do? Oh, because those freaking hospitals, you know, after she started dilating, they delivered the baby. Why? Oh, because they're required to by federal law. So what is Santangelo saying? Yeah, we just, we would break federal law here. Yeah, we wouldn't do that. And he literally says, we don't do that. We would just not help it. Don't worry. We'll make sure that you get what you paid for. You see, when you pay for an abortion, you're actually not paying for an abortion. You know what you're paying for? You're paying for a dead child. No, seriously. This is why, the, the, this is why you get these stories 
like Kermit Gosnell, right, who's serving multiple life prison sentences. Have you heard that name? Maybe if you listen to this show, you have. But if, if you haven't, it's probably, once again, because the activist, the activist media and the culture of death don't want to talk about these grisly abortionists who kill babies in the third trimester, right? Um, but Kermit Gosnell was severing, was severing the spinal cords of babies born alive during botched abortion procedures. I'm not freaking kidding, okay? There's a, there's a documentary on, on him, so if you're new to the pro-life movement, you need to go watch it. But if these babies were born alive during a botched abortion, he would, he would hold them up by their ankles, okay? So we're talking about an infant now full-blown infant outside of the womb, riddling around, the blood's going to the baby's head while the baby's screaming, expecting the warmth of their mother's breasts. And he would take scissors and he would just snip their spinal cord. Okay, so he's serving multiple life prison sentences. Now, you know, the left will say, well, that was an anomaly, right? That doesn't really happen. How do you know it doesn't happen? The abortion industry is the least regulated medical industry in the country. That's why they get away with these things all the time. That's why every time pro-lifers try to pass legislation that will allow um, more investigations to ensure compliance with, um, with uh, you know, medicinal uh, requirements or, uh, you know, making sure that centers are operating according to the law and all this stuff. The abortion industry always files a lawsuit. They don't want people coming into these abortion centers to make sure that they're up to code because they're often not up to code. Okay, so he's saying basically the same thing. He's saying, yeah, we would just let the baby die. And then he has the balls, the, the gall to compare that to a terminal cancer patient who is already almost dead. Did you catch that? He says, it's like a terminal cancer person that you wouldn't help. You know, these DNR orders do not resuscitate because they're so close to death anyways. That, and he says, so that's, that's, that's actually just like allowing an infant to die who is only alive right now because they escaped the forceps that you paid me to dismember them with and they accidentally slipped out of your vaginal canal before I could tear them limb from limb and now they're on the hospital table expecting their mother? Oh, frick. Um, yeah, so actually killing them, that's actually just the moral equivalent of your 85-year-old grandpa dying from cancer who you choose to not continue to keep alive through life support because they're going to die naturally through their disease anyways. That's really just the same if you really think about it, right? This is the kind of demon this man is. If I have to explain to you the difference between those two, by the way, you should probably stop listening to the show because you're probably too far gone, but I'll do it anyways. That's the difference between uh, someone dying naturally um, who is only being kept alive through extraordinary forms of life support so they're no more, unfortunately, going to function like they're supposed to. And the difference between the unborn who is in the, in the position of not yet, they have not yet even lived very much. They've not yet realized their potential. They've not yet lived outside the womb. And they have their whole lives in front of them. And they're not dying because of some disease that you're choosing to not treat. They're dying because you're dismembering them in the womb. You're murdering them. Okay, that's obviously the difference there. But he, he has the balls to compare not treating with, with not treating, he, he says like letting die, we'd let them die. No, you're not letting them die, you're killing them uh, to someone dying from cancer that they chose not to care for. And then he says, you don't have much time left, so you should probably do this right away. Right, because because he doesn't want to be in a position where that baby is born alive during a botched abortion. So he'd rather do it quicker to remain um, under the radar for his crimes. Absolutely disgusting. This man is a demon. Um, and most people don't even know his name. Most people don't even know his name. Pro-life activists Lauren Handy and Teresa Bukovinak recovered the 115 babies murdered by Santangelo recently at Washington, D.C. Surgery Clinic. Go back and listen to the episode with my friend A.J. Hurley, who was called by Lauren and Teresa to help unbox these children and take photographs of them. Um, and they apprehended a driver from a, a, a bus who worked for Curtis Bay Energy which is the waste management company that picks up the murdered babies at the Washington, D.C. Surgery Clinic. By the way, that, uh, that location is at 2112 F Street, Northwest, Suite 400, Washington, D.C., 20037. All available online, of course. So this happens with waste management companies, right? Someone has to come and, take up and pick up the murdered babies and all their, all their body parts. Um, and an in instance like this hasn't happened in decades where pro-lifers were actually able to convince the driver of the waste management truck to give them some of the remains of the children. An instance like this hasn't happened in, I think, over 20 or 30 years. This never happens, right? Because the abortion industry can only operate when they operate in secrecy. Can you imagine if the, if the weekly or monthly supplies of aborted murdered children were dumped outside of the city hall um, of local counties or, or uh, you know, 
um, cities in, in which abortion centers operate, I think people might live a little differently if they had to smell and look at what they were tolerating and what they were calling reproductive justice. So, of course, the abortion industry and their vendors, they, they probably one of their biggest security uh, threats would be uh, allowing their, their, their victims to be exposed to the American public. So through a providence, so, sort of sovereign act of God, these pro-lifers were able to get these mutilated children. According to Curtis Bay Energy from their website, they say, quote, that they are the only facility in the Northeast region that utilizes waste to energy incineration to safely convert infectious biomedical waste and non-hazardous pharmaceuticals into useful energy. Okay, let me translate that for you. It means they burn the bodies of the babies to convert it into energy. I'm not kidding. Go look it up. Now, you, now you want proof of this, by the way? Okay. Um, that line is no longer on their website. So for all the people who say, Seth, you're a conspiracy theorist. That's a GOP Republican talking point that's just trying to be used to win political hits against the left. Really? Really? Well, then why don't they just deny it and say, of course we don't do that. We do that with the organs of adults um, who died and whose uh, families uh, sort of consent to it or if the individual consented to it to have their body parts given away for whatever use. Why don't they just deny it and say, oh, of course we don't do that with the remains of aborted children? <laughs> why? Because then they might have to admit that that's wrong and that they're actually humans and children, right? And secondly, uh, their, their deleting of that paragraph on their website is obviously an attempt to cover up what they're doing, okay? So that language has since been removed from the website, but you can still find the screenshots from pro-lifers who do great uh, investigative journalism and research onto these waste energy, uh, waste management companies that pick up the mutilated bodies of children who were murdered at abortion centers. OK, so so I mean, we're going to have to apologize to the Nazis, right? We, we burn the bodies of aborted children to 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 power our televisions, OK, and to power our cities. Can you think of something more demonic and dystopic? Than that, and this is happening in the real real world, and yet almost nobody actually knows about it. Okay, so uh, uh, now if you want the whole story, you got to go back and listen to my episode "Justice for the Five with A.J. Hurley. Okay, we're talking about my buddy, uh, director of the survivors of the abortion Holocaust, precious man who loves the Lord and the unborn, who was there as they unboxed these children. Okay, these are 115 babies that um was that okay? Listen, that was from one box of four boxes that the Curtis Bay Waste Management Company picked up that day. One of four boxes. So you were talking hundreds and hundreds of aborted children that were being picked up that day, okay? Um, and five of those 115 babies were killed at or after 27 weeks, okay? And my friend A.J. Hurley is um, works with preemies in hospitals, prematurely born babies. So guess what? He kind of knows what prematurely born babies look like and their size, um, and so he has assured me that um, all of these were – one was probably right around 27 weeks. The other four were way past 27 weeks, so way past the time when you could survive outside the womb. By the way, you probably know people who were born at 27 weeks, between 27 and 37 weeks, right, Pre premature. I'm sure you do. We all do. Um, well, these, these babies were murdered uh, weeks after they could have survived um, outside the womb. And one or two of these babies, if not more, were quite clearly murdered through partial birth abortion. Uh, and you can go back to um, episode 197 if you're interested in hearing a description from the inventor of the partial birth abortion procedure, Dr. Martin Haskell, as he explains how this procedure operates. But, you, you know, you partially deliver a baby by their legs. You leave the head and the shoulders in the vaginal canal. You stick Metzen bomb scissors. You stick it into the back of the neck. You open the scissors, and you stick a suction catheter vacuum tube into the back of the head, and you suction the brain out so the baby's skull collapses. So when I show you these photos in just a second, you're going to notice how some of these skulls are collapsed in. I wonder how that freaking happened. Well, probably partial birth abortions, which are illegal at the federal level because, you know, it's only illegal if you murder a baby partially outside of the womb or fully outside of the womb, but not if you kill them fully in the womb. Because remember, that birth canal, it's magical and it confers personhood. Right? Well, welcome to secular progressivism. Welcome to La La Land, where, where apparently children get rights and it's wrong to kill them because they, their last toe left the vaginal canal or some crap like that. But of course, in partial birth abortions, you deliver the baby the other way. You pull them out by their legs and leave the head in the vaginal canal. So some of these babies were clear clearly killed through partial birth abortions. I posted these on my social media, but for those of you guys who watch the show on YouTube, you need to see the reality of this. So we have a few here we want you to look at, and, and I can only stare at the screen for, for a couple seconds. I've spent, I've spent long enough looking at these, um, but you'll notice as we just keep going through these, you'll notice that some of these baby skulls um, 
are are partially collapsed in. Um, these were five of 115 that um, my friends uh, held in their hands um, as they photographed um, to expose the deeds of darkness, as Ephesians 5.11 tells us to do. Uh, anyone who's okay with this um, or who calls this reproductive health care um, or even a necessary evil to maintain women's equality is a demon and should be treated as such um, and should be prayed for. Um, and if you're okay with this or if you're a pro-life evangelical for Biden and you say you're pro-life but you like the, the whole life, quality of life policies of Democrats, um, you need to repent and you need to stare at these photos until you realize the kind of people that you've been voting for and what they enable in our country. Um, so the pro-life movement has been calling for the D.C. Medical Examiner's Office, which is tasked to investigate criminal abortions to perform autopsies to confirm how many of these children were, if any, killed by partial birth abortions. But so far, the D.C. Medical Examiner's Office um, has indicated no intention of investigating whether the five infants were killed by potentially illegal methods. Why, 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 why? For you, for you, you know, pro-choice moderates who don't like late-term abortions, but you're okay with early-term abortions, ask yourself why they wouldn't perform the autopsies. Because if, if the babies weren't killed through partial birth abortions, then great, who cares, right? Well, of course, it's still wrong, right? Even though it's legal, it doesn't mean it's right. But, but okay, they didn't break the law. Okay, then let's just, let's prove they didn't break the law. What's the problem? Because you don't want people breaking federal law, right? So, so you'd be fine making sure that they didn't. Oh, but if they did, then you'd be forced to answer the question why you're enabling abortion, abortionists like Cesare Santangelo to operate in America. And then you'd be forced to, to um, t articulate to the American public specifically why it's okay to kill a baby by stabbing their skull with scissors in the womb and tearing their limbs off, but it's wrong to do it outside the womb. Yeah, it's, it's wrong to do it when they're like partially in the womb. Oh, that's super wrong. Oh my gosh. If their legs are flailing around outside the vaginal canal, but their head is still in the, in the birth canal, well, that's totally fine if you kill the baby that way. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's wrong if you kill the baby that way. That's a violation of federal law. But if you, if you kill the baby fully in the womb, then that's okay, right? Th these are the answers they'd be forced to, to questions they'd be forced to answer right, and explain to the American public that has a far more semi-functioning moral compass than the modern left today if they were to call for autopsies to confirm what we all freaking know by looking at those photos, that some of those babies were killed through partial birth abortions. By the way, uh, Cesare Santang Santangelo probably does around 100 to 150 surgical abortions a month. This would not include medication abortion, so the, the abortion pill, so increase that number. So he probably does anywhere from five to seven surgical abortions per day. He, that means he could be likely killing upwards of 1,500 to 1,800 babies a year just through surgical abortions, and he's been an abortionist since 2007. So if you do the math, he may have killed upwards of 22,000 children, 22,000 babies since he became an abortionist in 2007. And you know what? It's way more than that when you include in the medication abortion pills, way more than that, which was brought to America legally in one of Bill Clinton's first actions as president in 2000. So it's been here since before 2007. So I don't know. I don't know. 35, 40,000. I have no idea how many babies this guy's killed. I'm just, I'm just giving you guesstimates. And we in America, we, we dare to rent our gar garments and scream for justice over Vladimir Putin or something like that, or the historical crimes of slavery in America. While Planned Parenthood alone kills more unarmed black lives in the womb every two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. Equity and anti-racism. What a joke we are as American citizens. We have more rage and frustration over the fact that no one we know owns slaves than we do over the fact that 2.5% uh, of the American public, black women of childbearing age, are obtaining 37% of the abortions, according to U.S. Census Bureau statistics, meaning that abortion has killed way, 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 way more black people than slavery could have ever dreamed of in its dizziest daydreams. I believe it's, over, I believe it's uh, way north of 20 million black people who have been lynched in the womb through legalized abortion since 1973 in America. By the way, Santangelo doesn't even have a medical license. Did I mention that? Yeah, it was revoked years ago. 
So if you're wondering, well, what the heck, Seth? Because well, in D.C., you don't need a medical license to perform abortions. That's why. So, so next time they tell you that they're, they care about women's health care, uh, you can throw that back in their face. If you cared about health care and abortion is health care and abortion isn't just another form of surgery, then why shouldn't the surgery of abortion and the medical professionals who perform that surgery be held to the same medical requirements as any other surgeon in America? <laughs> right, because they know that if they call for more regulation and safety in abortion, then it'll begin exposing the heinous crimes that the abortion industry commits and how abortion not only kills babies, but actually endangers the mothers who are getting those abortions. That's why. Unbefreaking leaveable. So you need to meet this mass murderer. I want to finish with some Google reviews of women who actually sat in his center before we finish the show today. These are three reviews of the Washington, D.C. Surgery Clinic where San Santangelo is the only abortionist, by the way. He's the only abortionist there. Okay? You got it? And I think there's over 20 abortion clinics in D.C. alone. It's unreal. Okay, this was from 2022. This was from this year. And this came out on a Google review of his, of his concentration abortion center shortly after the five murdered infants were exposed by pro-life activists, murdered at the hands of Santangelo. Santangelo, sorry. Here's what this woman says, and we have a screenshot of this. I went in for a three-day procedure and only went in for one day. I changed my mind and decided not to go through, and the items inserted in me had fallen out, so I took it as a sign to keep the baby. Remember, with late-term abortions, you have to start dilating the cervix first, so they send you home, and then you come back. But hours later, I was in pain, and when I called the doctor, he said it was normal for me to take another sleeping pill early morning, or, and then early morning, I woke up covered in blood, barely conscious, falling in and out of sleep. At some, at some point, I tried to get out of bed, to call for help, crawling on the floor to my phone on the table. So at this point, her review claims that the facility um, sent a Hispanic staffer to her hotel, which was located right next to the abortion facility, which is a tactic often used by abortion facilities that perform late-term abortions. She says, I dialed them, and they said to come right away because it was right next door to the hotel. I told them I couldn't stand. I, was, I knocked out and was laying in my own blood for hours on the floor, the Hispanic lady came to my hotel room hours after with a wheelchair and told me that I had to get myself into the chair because there was no way she could help lift me, which I was only 127 pounds, literally 4'11". I struggled trying to lift myself up. I don't understand why they didn't bring, decide to bring an extra person. I was in labor. I don't remember what ex happened exactly or even if he was born alive at 27 weeks. When I asked questions, no one told me anything other than that wasn't supposed to happen. Oh, it's been months, and all I feel is regret and definitely traumatized. The Hispanic lady was horrible during my labor. She was yelling at me to be quiet because I was scaring the patients in the next room. By the way, so this is, this is reproductive health care, guys. After I pushed him out, okay, so you understand what she's saying here, right? This sounds like a labor induction abortion, like the baby's being delivered. So was this baby killed after birth? Was it killed as it was coming out of the birth canal? Who knows? I didn't even get a glance at him, the baby, because she rushed out of the room. I honestly wish I would have called an ambulance or at least gotten answers to my questions or the option to have him buried. And I know I have no right because I signed the papers, but it didn't go as planned, and I changed my mind. I would be lying if I said it doesn't keep me up and cause me to have severe anxiety. The aftermath is far worse with the body changes and not knowing. There you go. So a little bit about Santangelo's killing center. Here's a 2013 review. This woman says, this place is the most horrifying place ever. Please do not do it here. Of course, she's saying an abortion. So tragically, she still sounds pro-choice. She said, just go, go kill your baby somewhere else. But I was 21 weeks along, and my son had a very bad heart problem, and he would not live. I decided to go ahead with the late-term abortion and made the two-hour drive to the clinic. The staff has no compassion. The place is so dirty. Dr. Santangelo had blood on his lab coat. I wanted so bad to leave, but was told it was too late. Horrible place. Worst day of my life. Doctor was very rude, and she says, and not rough. I don't know what she meant by that. Not a good place or doctor. He will burn, she says. Wow. And a 2011 review, this woman says, worst place ever. Advertised as a compassionate place. This is an overcrowded meat market where with antiqu ant antiquated dirty equipment and insufficient staff. We wanted our baby, but it was terminal, and continuing the pregnancy would have been dangerous. There were 19 women there all day, but only seven seats in a tiny waiting area. Women had to sit on the floor or in the hallway. There is no communication as to what is happening and what the timeline is since there is no receptionist. One of the nurses doubles as a receptionist in the morning before the doctor even come, comes in. You have to come in at 9 a.m. and the doctor won't show up until afternoon. 
if something goes wrong, there was not enough staff to address the issue. They needed to use a wheelchair after one girl who was sitting in the hallway had a reaction, and they couldn't even get the wheelchair through the doors without other patients helping move chairs out of the way. Right after that, there was screaming, crying, glass breaking, things being thrown heard from the back, and the doctor calling for his nurses in a panicked voice. At no time did anyone let the waiting area know that everything was under control. Oh, and ladies, if you are there and need to use the bathroom, you have to call the office and get your call forwarded to the back and ask to be let in since all the doors are locked. There is no public bathroom in the building and no one manning or watching the front area. This is a total meat market, and they have absolutely zero compassion toward your circumstances, end quote. Wait, so are you telling me that the people who murder babies and call them non-persons and push to remove every type of health care regulation to ensure safety for patients on the abortion industry in order to profit off of women who they treat as the second prospect for abortion, the unborn child being the first prospect for abortion, are you telling me that they don't care very much about the lives of women? Oh, I'm so shocked. Of course. This is a profit industry. You have to get mothers into the door to profit off of killing their children. So already you don't care about either patient, the mother or the unborn child. So this shouldn't surprise you if you're truly woke about what's happening in our country on the issue of abortion. But this is the reality. This is the legacy of Dr. Cesari Santangelo, a mass murderer, a serial murderer that no one knew the name of virtually in America until a few weeks ago. And yet most people still won't because the the halls of power, okay, and the activist media and all of their tentacles have virtually refused to cover this. Here's the way they've covered it. Anti-abortionist conspiracy theorists harbor and hide dead babies in their living room, meaning they just, yeah, they had to take them somewhere to unbox them and expose to the American public these crimes. That's how they covered it not the likely partial birth abortions of Santangelo or the fact that he, that he cares nothing about the, the, the women who come through his doors. I want to finish with this last um, historical insight for you as we close off the show. And I, and I ask you to share this episode with, with your pastor, huh? How about that? How about the, 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 the social justice churches who, who talk about bringing the heart of God and the compassion and the gospel into the public square for the least of these, who are silent on abortion, the greatest example of, of destroying the least of these in the freaking world. You know those pastors who, who speak out on every form of evil that it's politically acceptable to do so on, but are silent on the greatest injustice in human history, and they fold like a cheap suit so they don't lose the tithing of their Democrats who attend their church. Right, those people, why don't you send this episode to some of those pastors? Why? Because one day we are going to have to take those pastors and American evangelicals, and you know what, American citizens, through the concentration camps of America called abortion clinics and make them smell and see the horror that they tolerated in their country. Just like U.S. allied troops did to German citizens after the Holocaust. When U.S. forces liberated the Buchenwald concentration camp in Germany in April of 1945, U.S. soldiers escorted German citizens from the nearby town of Weimar through the Buchenwald camp to force them to smell and view the atrocities that were committed right down the road from their comfortable little lives. As probably the ashes of the Jewish bodies fell on the roofs of their homes as they were having nice comfortable dinners. Perhaps one day soon, pro-life leaders can and will walk American pastors through Santangelo's concentration camp and the 750 other abortion mills in this country and make them smell and walk through the bodies of the mutilated children whose dismemberment never bothered them enough to act, to get off the bench, to sacrifice on behalf of the least of these. The same pastors who talk to us about loving neighbor. Wear the stupid face diaper or you don't love your neighbor, remember? Get, get quadruple jabbed with a, a, a quote-unquote vaccine developed in one case and tested in every case on aborted baby cell lines. If you don't take that, you don't love your neighbor. The same people who love to talk about loving neighbors are silent on the murder of the only neighbor in America that it's legal to kill. Unborn children are the only neighbors we have who have no legal protections, who have no right to life. And one day, we as the pro-life movement and Christians will need to walk American citizens and the body of Christ through the mutilated bodies and scents and smells of God's image bearers 
whose mutilation, dismemberment, and freaking body parts being sold on the black market never bothered the bride of Christ whose second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor, to actually do something to love that class of neighbors. That is a day that I hope will come very soon because when that day comes, this atrocity ends. And when we have to smell abortion, you know, Abby Johnson, former Planned Parenthood Clinic director, has said, you know, abortion has a smell, right? I smelled it all the time. It was disgusting. And when I, when I did that ultrasound guided abortion, that smell overwhelmed me. Until the church begins to smell, walk through, and stare at the horror of this genocide, I don't know if anything will change. Thank you for tuning into the show. Share this episode with your friends. Share it widely. Expose the deeds of darkness. Expose this serial murderer who is just one of hundreds in this country who, whose crimes are lauded and celebrated by the culture of death. Thanks for joining me today. Head on over to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube. Give the show a rating and review. Let us know what you think. It really helps us reach more people, especially in one of the most politically propitious years for unborn children in our entire lifetime, being 2022. If you want to learn more and engage with me online, head on over to, I, to uh, SethGruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter to view my speaking schedule or to book me for an event soon as the calendar is filling up. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted.